today is an absolutely incredible day. And you know what we're doing? We're going to Ny Ålesund. And that is exciting. I can't wait! Welcome back to Svalbard everyone, it's me Cecilia, and today we are heading to one of the settlements I haven't taken you to yet. You see, Longyearbyen may be the main settlement on Svalbard and the only one with a proper airport, but there are a couple of other towns and research stations on the island as well. First of all, we have Bodensburg, which is a Russian coal mining settlement that lies about 60 kilometers west of Longyearbyen. It has a population of about 300 people at the moment, and the main industry is coal mining. But they also have a small tourist company offering tours, as well as a hotel, bar and restaurant. Then we have Pyramiden, which is known as the Soviet ghost town. This town used to have a population of over 1000 people, but it was abandoned in 1998. This town is also owned by the Russian state-owned company that runs Barnsburg and the current population is only around 10 people. It fluctuates a little according to the season, most of them being shuttled between Barnsburg and Pyramiden in order to keep the hotel and restaurant running. And then we have Ny Ålesund, which is one of the four permanent research stations we have on the island. But much more on that later. Now let's get the day started. Njolesund is a settlement that's even further than Longyearbyen, but it's you can't just go and live there. I think you have to be like invited and get a job because it's for research and I think maybe only research, but also people from all around the world. So we're going to go there and I'm going to show you what it looks like. It is a really pretty town and like one of the most spectacular locations. I'm very excited, but the like where we're having breakfast today is also stunning and the sun I, I have no words we have clear skies and when I checked the forecast for this trip it was like rain clouds and wind and today we just have sunshine and glaciers and blue water and coffee which is semi good but I'm getting used to it now <laughs> I'm gonna come home a changed woman <laughs> oh my gosh Okay, I'm gonna show you the glacier on that side. Just to catch you up on where we are and what we are doing, this is day three of our Svalbard cruise that takes us along the west coast of Spitsbergen, all the way up to 80 degrees north. And now we are making our way down towards Longyearbyen again. We started the day with breakfast and then our morning briefing. Since we are entering a research area, it comes with some specific rules like radio silence, which means turning off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on all your devices. Our guide was Simon, who was actually a student at the Folk High School when I worked there, so it was great to have him as our guide. One thing that really stood out on this trip was just how knowledgeable the guides were. We were really impressed with Simon and how professional but also personable he is. He starts every day with a smile that spreads to the people around him. We are going to walk over to Ny London, but look at these ice blocks or the glacier ice. This day is just unreal. There's no wind and sunshine and we've been so lucky with the weather. Okay, let's look at this huge block of glacier ice. Look at this. The first landing of the day was in Kongsfjorden, across the bay from New Ålesund, at a place called Ny London. 
This is the remains of yet another mining facility. This one established in 1911 by the Northern Exploration Company, an English company headed by Ernest Mansfield, who became legendary in Svalbard during the first decades of the 20th century. To some, he was a saint, to others, a swindler. In his short career in the company, he established many different locations around the island. He built camps to try to mark and protect the land claims, hiring trappers to look after them during the winter months. Mansfield discovered marble on the island in 1906, after which he described the deposits as being no less than an island of pure marble. Around 1912, a sizable amount of the mined marble was shipped to England in order to convince investors. However, the marble turned out to be useless due to the effects of frost weathering, causing it to literally disintegrate as it reached warmer climates. Despite the fact that Mansfield basically was the company, after the marble fiasco, he was removed from the leadership in 1913. After that, he had nothing more to do with the company. In 1920, the location was left to the elements and today New London's weathered huts and ruins of rusted machinery make for a mining era time capsule. I love being out on the fjords on Svalbard. It's just something so special. And also what I really love is that there's no internet connection, no phone signal, nothing. So you're really in the moment and disconnected, which is also a very good way to stay away from the hackers and the dangerous internet trolls, which brings me to today's sponsor, which is NordVPN. I have been using NordVPN for over three years now and see it as a vital part of my online safety. And NordVPN is so much more than just a VPN service. Something that I've seen a lot of in my inbox lately are phishing scams, and they are getting more and more sophisticated by the day. You receive an email about changing your password or with imposter links mimicking your bank or social media, and you don't know if it's real or not. In cases like this, NordVPN's threat protection feature is your best friend. It gives you warnings about unsafe websites and automatically scans all downloaded files and attachments for malware. If they're not safe to open, they're automatically deleted to prevent any damage to your device. Head to nordvpn.com slash Cecilia or click the link in the description to get four months for free on a two-year plan. And it's all risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee, which is ideal. So while I'm staying safe on the fjords of Svalbard, <laughs> far away from the internet connection, use a VPN instead. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit easier, you know, a little bit faster, just a click of a button. Oh, what a day. What a day. Any coffee or breakfast, uh, English breakfast? Yes, yes. What a day. How many times have I said it? I'll keep saying it. For the people on the back. Hello, darling. Hello. What are we going to get at the new Olesund gift shop? Maybe a buff? Yes, a buff. Lunch time. This is just a, as we say it in Swedish, a transport streck to the Transport streck to the waffles. Yes. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been in a fjord with this much ice. This is the biggest ice block ever. Wow.
We have made it to Nyålesund. Yeah! I've been here before. You too, Christopher, right? But this is a gorgeous place. Around 110 people live here in the summer, and then in the winter, only like 30. And it's only a research village, so you can't really just come and live here. And we're gonna go and look at the little village now. It's incredibly beautiful here. Nyålesund is a settlement with a dramatic history. In the period of 1917 to 1962, King's Bay Kull Company ran mining operations in Nyålesund. Throughout this period, there were a number of accidents and a total of 76 people lost their lives in mining related activities. What ultimately became the end of the mining community in Nyålesund was the big mining accident on the 5th of November, 1962. The accident claimed 21 lives in total. 10 bodies were possible to recover while the remaining 11 got the mine as their final resting place. From the end of the 1960s, scientific research has been the main activity in Nyålesund. Today, 11 institutions from 10 countries have established permanent research stations here, carrying out research in fields such as atmospheric physics, biology, geology, glaciology, and oceanography. Ja. This feels incredible. It's incredible. We bought <laughs> first of all What we chose to buy was Nokko and then one massive Christmas decoration <laughs> which I'm so excited about. It's a Santa Claus riding on a polar bear on a glacier block of ice. <laughs> it was 70 bucks. Because it's 700 kronor I feel like money well spent. And then I bought a beanie and a buff. Now you know, I might show it all when we get home. Now we're gonna do some walking around. The groups from the boat are getting guided tours, but we decided to just walk around on our own. It's beautiful here. Even though record amounts of coal were extracted between 1925 and 1928, this is not what New Orleans became world famous for. The town became the starting center for the race to the North Pole. A community of 271 people, a dock, a telegraph station, as well as technical and practice expertise, only 1,231 kilometers from the North Pole, meant that New Orleans was the best place in the world for expeditions to the North Pole. This was the starting point for famous explorers. Roald Amundsen, known as the first person to reach both the South and the North Pole, used New Olesund as his base when he journeyed to the North Pole in 1926 with the airship Norge. Family life was not very common in like the settlements of coal mining on Svalbard, but here in New Olesund, there were a bunch of small family houses. And this is one of those houses. Today, New Olesund is a research station with about 40 residents living here throughout the whole year. But in the summertime, the population count can on occasion rise to around 150 people. There are no accommodation offers available for tourists in the settlement. You can only come and stay at the hotel if you are invited by a friend or family member working there. The same goes for living. You can only stay in New Olesund if you are working there.
there was just a teeny tiny little super cute fox walking around here. And then I went over to that side and it was just chilling. And then when we were watching the fox, there was a seal that also came up and was like, hello? <laughs> it's like a zoo out here. Love it. I love it so much. Wow. It is so gorgeous. I think like the outside of this boat is spectacular. It gives me, I was going to say Titanic vibes, but I mean like pre iceberg. It's just so pretty with all of the wood and I mean, it was built in 1956. You can see that. The thing is the inside though, isn't really what I would say up to standards if I'm being honest. But if you just stay on the outside, it's idyllic, absolutely gorgeous. But the inside, I think for what you pay and what you kind of do expect, like it's not great but definitely the outside is gorgeous. And I'm also not at all trying to be overly critical. Like I'm, like I'm not thinking it's a luxury cruise, but you do pay quite a lot for this. Like when it comes to the route and everything else and like where we are in location and the guides, absolutely incredible. Oh my gosh. And it's a well-oiled machine. Like when they take us to landings, like everything is just smooth. There is, they know exactly what they're doing every single one and everything is fast and just, they're so nice and they're so accommodating. So guides and staff are like 10 out of 10. Landings, 10 out of 10. Uh, food, I'd say maybe like six out of 10. It's okay, you know? Coffee is a one, <laughs> one out of 10. What else? Outside, 10 out of 10. Uh, cabin, five. Five out of 10. <laughs> but they are also changing it out in after next season. So I have a feeling that they also know that this ship is too old on the inside. You know what I mean? That was it for the Svalbard cruise experience of this year. Like I mentioned, they will be switching this ship out for a sister ship that is newly renovated after next season, which I think will do a world of difference because the route and the guides are really superb. We were also incredibly lucky with the weather. So all in all, it has been a good few days of seeing some new places. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you on Sunday because there are two videos this week. Have an amazing day. I appreciate you. Okay, bye.